In Newfoundland, July 1st is a national holiday, just as it is across Canada. But here they have a very different reason to mark the date. Because that day is the anniversary of a defining moment in Newfoundland's history. A moment which was to change the aspiring nation of Newfoundland forever. Present. Box. Reload. It happened on July 1st, 1916. The middle day of the middle year of the First World War. Across these fields in northern France, the British Army launched the greatest attack in its history. One of the units going into action was a regiment from Newfoundland. They went over the top near a village they pronounced Beaumont Hamel. What the Newfoundlanders did here that morning and what happened to them still stands out even among the horrors of the war which they called the Great War. August 1914. All Europe has gone to war. The armies of Germany's Kaiser, seen as a brutal demon by British propaganda, have conquered Belgium and invaded France. Britain's small army needs a million new soldiers. The clarion call for volunteers goes out across the nation and throughout the empire, wherever people feel loyalty to Britain. There is no place more loyal than Newfoundland. Home to just a quarter of a million people, the island is Britain's oldest overseas territory. The self-governing colony is enjoying growing prosperity, and its elected leaders are eager to show that Newfoundland, like its rival Canada, can contribute to the defense of the empire. The governor announces that Newfoundland will raise its own regiment at its own expense. Most people expected, as they did everywhere, that this was going to be a very short event. It, it's almost in a way like the World Cup uh, experience in which um, uh, nations gather together in a single place and they compete and uh, the great winner is declared and it's a moment of great pride. In this particular case, uh, Newfoundland was part of the team. Boys rush to join the regiment. The majority are from St. John's, but there are also lads from the outports, a lone Eskimo from Labrador, and Walter Tobin, the nephew of a Duckworth Street barber. It was something new for our generation. It was an adventure. It's just like watching a motion picture that gets you stirred up emotionally. Walter and his older brother Jimmy both want to join. But their uncle doesn't want to lose his helpers. Jimmy defies him. But at 17, Walter's too young to join. Soon the regiment has more than 500 raw recruits, ready as a priest thunders from the pulpit to kick the Huns to blue blazes. That imperial education in Newfoundland at that time was as propagandistic as Soviet propaganda in the schools, frankly. I mean, it was, the empire was the best thing since sliced bread, and we were privileged to be part of it, and our duty, you know, Rudyard Kipling, all this stuff. Class divisions are reflected in the new regiment. Many officers are drawn from the families of Water Street merchants, like Owen Steele, a star athlete who is quickly promoted. The foot soldiers tend to come from the working class. But the whole community pitches in to help. There isn't enough khaki cloth to make putties, so the boys get their leg bindings in navy blue. And their nickname, the Blue Putties. And for a regimental symbol, they pick the caribou. The evening before the boys are to leave, the Women's Patriotic Association puts on a big show for them. One of the vignettes portrays a mother offering her sons to Britannia.
October 2nd, 1914, the biggest crowd in the history of Newfoundland watches the Empire's newest soldiers board the ship which will take them across the sea to Britain. Walter Tobin is in the crowd to wave goodbye to Jimmy. Jimmy and I got along very well. I wanted to be with him, really. It hurt me, because I was losing a very dear friend, my brother. Some of the men have never been out of sight of the island before, and the ship's hold still stink from a previous cargo of dead seals. But the boys don't mind. They are looking ahead to Britain and the great adventure. In Scotland, the Newfoundlanders are subjected to the rigors of British Army training under the stern eye of Sergeant Major Mackay. At first, enthusiasm is more evident than skill, and the drilling seems endless. But before long, they begin to feel and act like soldiers. One of them is Frank Lind, a clerk from Fogo, who becomes the unofficial cheerleader of the regiment in letters to the newspaper in St. John's. Two ladies looked at the badges on our shoulders and one said, where is nailed? They took the F or an E. I said, it is not nailed, it is NFLD, Newfoundland. Oh, she said, that's in Canada, isn't it? I looked around for a brick. Canada again. No, I roared. Newfoundland is a separate colony. Do they teach geography in your schools here? Rumors fly that their unit is too small and may be folded into the Canadian contingent. If Newfoundland hopes to avoid this fate, there's a price. More men. Walter Tobin sees his chance, but his uncle is even more opposed than before. I had a razor in my hand and I thought to cut my thumb, just the muscle above the thumb, so I wouldn't give any use as far as barbering was concerned. Well, I didn't have the courage to do that. But he does have the courage to lie about his age. The authorities look the other way, and he is soon sailing for Scotland with the second contingent. Walter's arrival is a surprise to his big brother Jimmy, but soon the two of them are shaving the regiment as official barbers. The men are now sure of fighting as the Newfoundland regiment Before the British send them to war, the boys get one last chance to change their minds. I mean, they only enlisted for a year, you know. And then they actually had to ask them, would they extend their enlistment for the duration of the war, or did they want to go home? Which some brave souls said yes, but most, of course, the social pressure forced them to commit for the duration of the war. So they immediately sent them off to Gallipoli. They expected to be sent to fight Germans in France, not Turks in Gallipoli. But it's still the enemy. May we do our part and bring honor to Terra Nova. It will not all be fun. For my opinion is, we have had the best of it so far. And now comes the sterner side. Well, we shall have to tell you all when we get back. And please God, we hope to all return again. Yours truly, Frank Lind. September 1915. As they approach the dry hills of Turkey, the men hear the rumble of the guns for the first time. The British are trying to open up a sea route to their ally Russia. But Gallipoli has been a disaster, with 200,000 Allied casualties, many of them Australians and New Zealanders. The Newfoundlanders join British regulars dug in below the steep hills, all held by the Turks. Now it becomes real. 
At present, the shells are coming fast and thick. If it were not for the dugouts, a man would have to stay in the open ground exposed until a shell dropped near him, and then he would likely go somewhere else, in sections, which would be rather unpleasant. Franklin. Newfoundlanders want action. They ask their general for permission to storm the hills, single-handed. The Turks were pouring a shell fire down uh, whenever they saw any movement. It was a dangerous place to be. Then uh, they said, okay, let's go ahead and we'll take them. However, wiser minds uh, said, hey, hey, look, uh, learn how to fight first, and I think it was a wise move. What the men expected was a chance to prove themselves in battle. What they get instead are hardships like the lice that make sleep impossible or the vermin that infest Walter Tobin's food. You had a spoonful of this jam, and before you got it, your mouth was filled with flies. You'd try to brush off as many as you possibly could, but you'd eat some of those flies. The men get dysentery, enteric fever, and Jimmy Tobin comes down with jaundice. It will be a long time before Walter will see his brother again. More than half the regiment, the uh, thousand men that were out there, were eventually evacuated sick. This is probably remembered more than the dozen or so who were killed. The British decide to withdraw, a risky operation. Owen Steele commands the rear guard. He has men rig rifles to fire after they have gone to make the Turks think they are still there. The retreat is the only thing that has gone right at Gallipoli. Owen Steele has found the Dardanelles frustrating. This trench warfare is really very monotonous. Not comparable to guerrilla warfare where one would get lots of excitement. However, we may get excitement yet. The army will soon provide it. But first, the regiment is sent to Egypt under a new commander. A relationship that will prove fateful. Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Haddo has been chosen because of his experience overseeing the natives of Sudan. He thinks of his new colonial troops as children who need discipline. He marches them into the desert. We didn't take too much water in our water bottles. We were told not to. Fellows start dropping out, just exhausted, and they called the roll, and if you didn't answer your name, oh, you got punished. You got field punishment number one. Walter Tobin and the others are staked out in the desert under the sun. They call it crucifixion. It is a standard army punishment. After a while, it got a little hot, so these guys uh, uprooted the stakes because they were only in the top of the sand and marched into a shady area and spent the time in the shady area rather than out in the sun. Uh, apparently, when Haddo heard of this, uh, he uh, <coughs> accepted this with good humor, or perhaps, but nevertheless, nothing was done, nothing was said. Haddo comes to tolerate his rebellious troops, and they warily give him their respect. There would be a preface of, well, he was hopelessly Brit, and then a but, and then, but he did look after us. At last, the regiment is ordered to France, where they are needed for the biggest offensive of the war. They head north to the Western Front. It is spring 1916. For a year and a half, the Central Powers and the Allies have faced each other across a corridor of death that snakes from the English Channel to the Alps in an unbroken, continuous front. Nobody saw this coming. They all assumed there'd be big battles and it'd be over in six months. They didn't even understand what was happening as the sort of armies bogged down and then they started extending their flanks up towards the sea. Um, but the problem was that the defensive was enormously more powerful than the offensive. The new weapons, like quick-firing artillery and machine guns which can fire ten bullets a second, make it almost impossible to move and have locked the two sides into a stalemate. Basically what you got, and this is the first time that this is the case, 
is that there's a sort of steel sleet moving about four feet above the ground, which prevents anybody crossing this ground. The continuous front has another problem, which is every attack has to be a frontal attack. No going around the flanks, no going around the sides, no cheap and clever. Get up and march towards the guns because that's the only way you can do it. And they didn't know what to do. The only answer the generals could think of in the middle of the war was to increase the numbers of infantry being poured into the attack. That was the only answer they had to this stalemate, hoping that sheer force of numbers and weight of artillery fire w would force the decision. The Newfoundlanders arrive in northern France. As they march across a bridge, they don't pay much attention to the river flowing beneath them. Its name is the Somme. Colonel Haddo leads the Newfoundland regiment into the French village of Louvancourt. This is where they will stay when they are not on frontline duty. While they wait for the generals to make their plans, they get used to trench life. They enter the trench system well behind the front lines. Weaving through communication trenches, they pass the reserve trench and the support trench. Then finally, they reach the frontline firing trench. Here there are dugouts for the officers and funk holes for the men, but not much else. Here is where they work, eat, sleep, and get shelled. Rats, rats, rats. My God, they were big. There's plenty of food out there for them, bodies in no man's land. I went out over the top and started chasing rats with this club I had. And the next thing I know... Walter Tobin just makes it back to safety. Some soldiers cannot stand living this way and they crack. Sometimes it is called shell shock and they get discharged. Sometimes it's called cowardice, and they get shot. The Newfoundlanders know nothing about what the generals are planning. As a battalion of a thousand men, they are at the bottom rung of a huge structure. Commanded by Colonel Haddo, the 1st Newfoundland is just one battalion of the 88th Brigade led by a Brigadier General, which is a part of the 29th Division led by a Major General which is a part of eight corps led by a lieutenant general, which is a part of the fourth army led by a full general, which itself is just one of five armies led by, at the pinnacle of this pyramid of a million men, General Sir Douglas Haig. Haig is a lifelong army man whose family is famous for making whiskey. As powerful as he is, Haig has to share all his decisions with his allies, the French. The French army is close to complete collapse in Verdun, and Haig must attack to relieve them, or the Allies will have to negotiate peace. And the mood at home is not for peace. For the great push, Haig and the French settle on an area in northern France, just north of the River Somme. It's an area of the front that wouldn't actually yield any wonderful results if you did break through. Uh, because it's where the British and French armies join. You know, the French to here, now it's British, so that's where we'll have the battle. That's not what I would call a, a, an intelligent use of ground. But the Somme is where Haig will use his huge new army of volunteers to break through the deadlock and get back to what he knows best as a cavalryman, a war of movement. First, the infantry must capture the German trenches Haig instructs his army general, Sir Henry Rawlinson, to come up with a plan. Rawlinson bases his plan for something like 12 or 14 frontline divisions on one single premise, and that is that artillery bombardment of five days would destroy the German barbed wire, 
the trenches and the trench garrisons. The bombardment Rawlinson orders will be the most massive in history. Haig suggests to Rawlinson that during the barrage, the infantry crawl out into no man's land and, the minute the shelling stops, rush the German trenches. But in fact, Rawlinson said, this won't be necessary. Um, I want my attacking troops to stay in their own trenches until zero hour. Zero hour is when the bombardment lifts. And then they will file out into no man's land. They will line up in a series of waves and walk across no man's land and keep everything under control because the Germans will all be dead. The plan filters down the chain of command and is explained to the Newfoundland officers. The battalion is to be in the second part of the attack, to walk over the captured front line to occupy enemy positions near the German-held village of Beaumont Hamel. The men will go into action on July 1st, 1916. June 24th, the barrage begins. Every day, a quarter of a million shells are brought up to be fired by over 2,000 guns. Their thunder can be clearly heard across the channel in England. Close up, the noise is unimaginable. soldier huddles in his dugout and prays. Five days and five nights now this hell concert, this drum fire has lasted. One's head is like a madman's. The tongue sticks to the roof of the mouth. Nothing to drink, no sleep. What anxiety our loved ones must feel about us. June 29th, a party of Newfoundlanders goes out to raid German trenches. Bush Callahan knows a few German words, and he sang out, How many men in this dugout? The Germans, thinking it was one of their officers, replied, Eleven. Then said Bush as he threw in two bombs, Share these amongst you. Oh, if you could have heard the roar of those bombs in that confined space, the screams of the baby killers, and the patter of Callahan's feet as he beat a hasty retreat. Yours truly, Frank Lind. But the Newfoundlanders report disturbing news. The British artillery has failed to cut the German barbed wire, and the Germans seem to be very much alive. Rawlinson decides this information can't be accurate. He wasn't a big enough man to say, something's going wrong, we're taking a terrible uh, risk in carrying out this plan. They had no other ideas. There was no contingency as, as to what was going to happen if the barbed wire was not cut and the Germans were not killed. And they just shut their minds to it and said, uh, it'll have to be all right on the day. It's a bit like a dreadful dress rehearsal, you know. One of their generals assures the regiment that they have nothing to fear and reminds them that they are the sole representatives of Newfoundland. Walter Tobin's held back, but he begs permission to go with the others. His wish is granted. Jimmy Tobin, on sick leave, sends his brother good luck wishes. June 30th, the night before the big push. The Newfoundlanders say farewell to Louvancourt. Owen Steele is being held back in reserve. He too has a younger brother going into action. He has to watch Jim Steele leave with the others. It's great to see how happy and light-hearted everyone is. And yet this is undoubtedly the last day for a good many. Of course, this is certainly the best way to take things and hope for the best. That night, Haig writes, With God's help, I feel hopeful. The men are in splendid spirits. The wire has never been so well cut, nor the artillery preparation so thorough. Everyone really believed that this was going to be a cakewalk. You know, this was going to be the battle that would end the war. It would be the decisive engagement that really would bring the Germans to the knees on the Western Front.
July 1st, 1916, 5.30 a.m. The day dawns brilliant and clear. The official cameraman has picked the Newfoundlanders division to record the victory. Along an 18-mile front, 120,000 young men prepare to go over the top. They outnumber the Germans seven to one. They are weighed down with shovels, bombs, ladders, wire cutters, in all 66 pounds. The Newfoundlanders wear silver triangles on their backs so that staff officers can observe the division's progress from afar. The British have spent months digging a mine under a section of the German trenches. 720. They detonate the mine. The artillery stops firing. 7.30 a.m., zero hour. The British go over the top, ready to cross no man's land to enemy trenches filled with nothing but German dead. And of course the Germans weren't dead. They had survived in the deep dugouts in which the trench garrisons could um, survive any bombardment. And when the bombardment lifted, the Germans raced up the steps. They could not believe their eyes. There, 350 yards away, the British were lining themselves up to cross no man's land, walking towards them. It was a machine gunner's dream. The Newfoundlanders wait in reserve. They can't see what is happening, but they can hear. The men who went over in the first wave could at least believe the attack was going to be a walkover. The Newfoundlanders have no such illusion. 8 a.m., zero plus half an hour. Almost everywhere, the British forces are being destroyed. 8.15, on the Newfoundlanders' left, men flee back to their own lines. The British guns aren't helping. They're shelling the German rear, not frontline machine guns that aren't supposed to be there. Now the German guns open up, raining down shells on no man's land and the Newfoundlanders' trenches. The men can't see much, but they know something's going very wrong. 8.20, the generals call off the Newfoundlanders' attack. 8.30, someone sees a white flare go up. It's a German signal telling their gunners to adjust their range. But a British general thinks it's his men calling for help from the German trenches. He orders two battalions to advance and support them, the 1st Essex and the Newfoundlanders. The Essex commander sends his men through communication trenches to get to their front line, but their way is blocked by hundreds of wounded and dead men. Haddo makes a different choice. He decides not to use the blocked communication trenches, but to send his men over the top from the reserve trench. And unlike the Essex, who hold some men back, Haddo orders his entire battalion to go over. Now it was their turn. For the first time, this is what they joined up for. And by Jove, they weren't going to hang about. They were going to show they were as good as anybody. Uh, they were Newfoundland's contribution to the British Empire at war. A wealthy St. John's beauty has said she will marry the first man to win the Victoria Cross. Some men yell out, Buxom Bessie or a wooden leg. James Steele mounts the ladder. Walter Tobin grips his rifle. As a soldier, you have to do it. You have to do it. If you don't, that's it. I get shot as a result of it. Derelict of duty. You're a member of the herd, a little sheep there, with a gun. I will ring off for this time, but I hope to write again shortly, when I hope to send everybody a very interesting letter.
Tell everybody that they may feel proud of the Newfoundland Regiment. With kind regards, Franklin. 915. Haddo sends a message to Brigade. The Newfoundlanders are moving. The trees and grass have grown again over the reserve trenches the Newfoundlanders climbed out of. But the path of their attack is still easily visible. The land rises a little as it approaches the British front lines. Then it dips into a concave area the Newfoundlanders had to cross to reach the Germans on the opposite side. Their machine guns were all along the ridge and dug deeply into the sides of the ravine below. Looking back from the Germans' point of view, the Newfoundlanders were silhouetted against the sky, a perfect target as they rose up out of their trenches to attack. 800 men struggle up over the top. They try to form up into their platoons. Haddo waves his walking stick at the German lines and they begin to go forward. Haddo returns to his post as ordered. All the other units are dead or taking cover. The Germans have no other targets. A boy is hit and crumples to the ground badly wounded. Walter Tobin stops to give him some water. Then he's hit as if by a sledgehammer. 250 yards to cross to their own front lines and four belts of British barbed wire. The men file through pathways cut in the wire. They are death traps. 66 are mown down in one pathway alone. Jim Steele avoids the alleys, tearing his puttees on the barbs. The men keep going. The only sign that they are under fire is that they tuck their chins into their shoulders, as though they are struggling home through a blizzard coming in off Cape Spear. They reach their own frontline trench, down to the trench, up the other side. A lone tree stands at the beginning of no man's land. There, Frank Lenz hit full in the chest. He dies at the base of the tree. Jim Steele makes it out into no man's land. All the German fire pours into the men that are left. Twenty men become ten. Ten become five. Jim Steele reaches the German wire, uncut by the artillery. He takes out a grenade. Then he is hit by shrapnel. He falls. It is 9.45. Not one man is standing. In about half an hour, the Newfoundland Regiment has been destroyed. Haddo looks out over no man's land, where hundreds of his men lie dead and wounded as a result of his order. I know just enough about war to know you can't blame people for this stuff. Um, it's incredibly noisy. Everybody is terrified. People are trembling. You are aware that if these guys have got into the trench in the first wave and you don't go to reinforce them, they will get killed and you will be court-martialed. The brigadier orders Haddo to round up some soldiers and try again but he can't find a single unwounded man. At last, a senior officer puts a stop to it. Walter Tobin is alive and close enough that he can crawl back. The medical staff are overwhelmed by the sheer numbers. Some of the men ask, is the colonel satisfied? Is the colonel pleased? 
Out in no man's land, Jim Steele regains consciousness. For the men still alive, the world has shrunk to a few yards of blasted earth. If they try to move, the silver triangle on their backs glints in the sun, alerting the Germans that someone is still alive. Jim Steele lies very still. He waits for the light to fade, then begins the long crawl back to his own lines. In the night, the men in the trenches hear a sound. It is like huge, wet fingers scraping across a gigantic window. It is the mingled cries of all the men still out in no man's land. That morning uh, of the 1st of July, starting from 7.30 uh, until the middle of the morning or later when really the battle died down and all hope was gone, was the great turning point in the First World War for Britain and the, and the Empire. In one day, the British have suffered nearly 60,000 casualties. About 20,000 are dead, or soon will be. It is the worst day in the history of the British Army. And of all the units, none has suffered greater losses than the Newfoundland Regiment. Of 801 Newfoundlanders who went over the top, 68 are left to answer roll call. I think it would be hard to sort of put yourself really in the place of those who went over the top. Because they must have known as they were going forward that I'm going to be killed. The reason why may be explained by a corporate will that overtakes the individual will. I wouldn't have kept going, but I think they're from a different time and they believed in what they were doing much more than we believed in what they were doing. And you're with your friends and the most horrifying thing that can happen to a soldier is to lose the respect of his friends. July 1st is over. But for Newfoundland, the effects of this day are just beginning. Across the empire, the newspapers print the official line that the big push was a success. It takes two weeks for the grim truth to reach Newfoundland. Only when casualty lists begin to be published in the St. John's paper do people realize what has happened. People watch from their windows as the priest walks down the street to see which door he will knock on, whose curtains will be drawn. There is hardly a street in the city that in some way is not represented by the death uh, or by the wounding of somebody from that particular part of the community. The initial shock was bad enough, but there was then also a spreading awareness that lives are being wasted needlessly, that uh, the people in charge don't really know what they're doing, which they didn't, of course. The Newfoundland Regiment has to bring in hundreds of fresh recruits to keep going, but they do keep going and fight again and again in France. At Monchi, just nine men hold off an entire German division. A Newfoundland boy becomes the youngest soldier in the army to win the VC, though he doesn't marry Buxom Bessie. And because of its exceptional record, King George V confers on the regiment an honor given no other during the war. He grants it the title Royal. Oh, it's to encourage the troops. Um... It costs nothing. We will call you the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. And our little hearts are supposed to tremble with delight that His Majesty has deigned to confer this title upon us. Doesn't bring anybody back. The losses pile up. 
By 1917, the regiment can no longer attract enough volunteers. Against bitter resistance, the government in St. John's brings in conscription. Many Newfoundland families had lost a son or a brother or even a, a, a father. And uh, an awful lot of outport Newfoundlanders felt we've given enough, as much as we possibly can. And there were serious objections to conscription. In the end, the conscripts are not needed. Tanks and the Americans join the war. And in 1918, Germany gives up. Among the dead are Owen Steele and Jimmy Tobin, Walter's brother. Two of about a million soldiers from Britain and the Empire who have lost their lives. I get a bit emotional about this. It's, it was Britain and the Empire. Uh, we were all in it together. And uh, they're the great days of empire. It's a pity that so many men had to die to, to prove it. But Newfoundland's relationship with the empire was never to be the same. The financial costs of the war were immense. A staggering debt load plus corruption pushed Newfoundland to the edge. The depression pushed it over. Newfoundland went bankrupt. In 1932, desperate Newfoundlanders rioted in St. John's. The Dominion asked Britain to write off some of the debt. But when you recruit two and three members from almost every family in the, in the country and send them overseas to uh, fight a war, you expect some consideration for it. And the British government said absolutely no, we can't have a member of the Empire defaulting. In 1933, Britain took responsibility for the debt, but there was a price, the loss of self-government. Newfoundland reverted to being ruled directly by Britain. So Beaumont Hamill had a direct political impact on Newfoundland's future, because once we surrendered uh, responsible government, it was supposed to be returned automatically at the request of the people. But it didn't work out that way. After the Second World War, Britain was dissolving its empire. A referendum was held, and joining Canada was put on the ballot, the choice Britain backed. Divided Newfoundlanders narrowly voted against independence. And in 1949, Newfoundland became a province of its old rival, Canada. Now, what can Newfoundland send to Canada? Hazel? Fish! For years, Newfoundlanders held two celebrations on July 1st. One to commemorate Beaumont Hamill, the other for Canada's birthday. Recently, though, Memorial Day was moved to the closest Sunday. It was felt that its mood conflicted with Canada Day celebrations. I don't think this is the sort of thing you should muck around with. I, I, no, I, don't, I don't approve of turning it into a holiday that we move for convenience. I think Newfoundland became and has remained a much less trusting place as a consequence of Beaumont Hamill. You should look the horse in the mouth. What they tell you isn't necessarily true or fair or important. The site of the battle is now owned by the people of Newfoundland. When it was purchased after the war, the St. John's government couldn't afford a huge monument. So they preserved the site as it was. Walter Tobin survived the war. In 1991, he went back to France for the first time in 75 years and visited Jimmy's grave.
Walter Tobin died in Newfoundland in 1996 at the age of 98. He was the last survivor of the attack at Beaumont Hamill.